All right, so in um, chapter seven, we're gonna finish seven today, we're gonna start at eight. Um, in chapter seven, I know we went through a lot of this, and I'm gonna do the same thing tomorrow, by the way, 10 o'clock, I'll be online, you've got the link, and uh, what I'll do is I'll go through the um, chapter eight homework again, pointing out any of the perhaps nuances that'll save you a lot of time and the point is to make sure you learn something and not spin your wheels for hours trying to get through, you know, certain little quirks in the problem. So I'll go over all the homework with you and then we'll pick up on any other questions you might have on, on any other material. Now, the lower cost of market rule, or LCM. If you think about LCM, the lower cost of market, this is really an impairment test. So it's done at the end of the period after inventory is valued, LIFO, FIFO, what average cost, that cost is compared to market. If market is less than cost, a write down may have to be taken. So as we know, if you, let me bring up that, that graphic for you. So that, as you know, when we look at the historical cost concept, Cost is generally a ceiling on asset valuation. And of course, the asset, if it's completely worthless, gets written down to zero. So what we're saying here is in the lower of cost of market, if market is above cost, that's fine. Nothing happens to the inventory. You don't write it up. But if market falls below cost, and market in our text, as you can see, is net realizable value, which is selling price. Minus any disposal costs that you might have. So selling price minus shipping, transportation, whatever it may be. So if the market value collapses, you can't have your balance sheet carrying an asset that's above what it's gonna, gonna yield in terms of cash, correct? That would be overstating the asset. So here, you have to take a write down. And that write down is a loss. And it's generally recorded in cost of goods sold. Generally recorded in cost of goods sold. So think about running a business and looking at your inventory and you find out that the market for that product collapses. So you might have spent $30 a unit when you bought the product. Now you're not going to be able to sell them net of any sales commissions for more than 20. There's a $10 loss that you have to recognize. I mean, it just be logical. Now, of course, what you'd have to do is probably mark that price down to try to sell them to move the inventory. But again, if you have this inventory, whether it's LIFO, FIFO, weighted average, if it's carried at $30 and the market value falls to 20, then of course there's a loss on the inventory right now. So that loss has to be recognized in income now, not when you sell it. Remember, based on conservatism, we try to anticipate the loss. We don't wait until we actually sell it. If we realize that the market collapses for that product, um, that loss would be taken. Now, the lower cost of market rule and everything else, I mean, we're just probably um, just giving you the sort of the preliminary information on all of these topics. When we get into intermediate, we build this a little bit more and it gets a little bit more complicated than what you see here. So the other, I think, main issue, again, we write it down to, uh, to market, and it is reflected 
as part of the cost to be sold, as I said. Now, we have new standards, and those are the ones that we're going to pick up. And I just put this in. I, got a, I think I have one typo there. Uh, for LIPO, we will. LIPO um, inventory and retail inventory methods, we'll see that next semester. It gets a little bit more complicated, but um, it's going to result in the same basic idea about an impairment for a write down. Now, here's, I think, one of the main things we want to get across preliminarily in this course is that you can apply the lower of cost of market in a couple of different ways. You can apply it to individual items in inventory. So you look at every single item, cost versus market. You could look at it based on product line or total inventory. Now, if you do it by individual items, I'll show you some numbers in a second, you get the largest write-off. And tomorrow, when I go over some of the homework um, as well, We'll see, or at least, oh no, I'm sorry, we did last week, we went over some of that homework below, of course, the market. And you saw that if you group them, you are able to average out the ups and downs or the highs and the lows, and therefore the loss gets lower. If you don't average it out, if you go for the individual items, what happens? The loss is greater. So what could justify the averaging? And as I said, the averaging is justified based on the way you sell your products. So everybody knows that if you buy a printer, and I mentioned on Friday, that if you, you, know, you go to an Apple store, they have these deals where you buy a, a MacBook or a MacBook Pro now. You buy a MacBook Pro, we're going to throw in a printer, free. So what's the lower cost of market for that printer? You know, Apple might have put that printer in inventory at $75. They're giving it away. Is it worthless? No, because it drives the sales, number one, of their MacBooks. And it also, from the manufacturer's standpoint, whether it's Epson or Canon, uh, from their standpoint, I'll give you the printer, but you're going to have to buy my cartridges. And those cartridges are marked up phenomenal percentages. Right? So now you're stuck buying those cartridges. So in that case, I'd be able to group the product line cartridges and the toner and cartridges and, and the printers themselves. So when we take a write down, uh, under US GAAP, theoretically, you're not supposed to reverse them. IFRS allows you to reverse them. Uh, on, we're going to see a lot more IFRS next semester. And under IFRS, it's pretty much the same law of course to market. But if the market ever recovers, they allow you to write the asset up again, but they only allow you to write it up up to the original cost. So under IFRS, if there's a recovery, you can only recognize it up to the original cost. So you can only reverse out the loss. You can't recognize a loss. You can't recognize a gain above the original amount. Okay, now let's go to a disclosure. And this one is from Walmart. And let me just read this through with you and, and give you a, a sample of what you'd see out in the field. It tells you that the company values its inventory at lower cost or market. So now you know what that means. And it tells you that they use last in, first out for substantially all of its US segment inventories. And they use first in, first out for Walmart International. Why? Why don't they use LIFO International? Well, it's a tax reason. Yeah, it's a tax and, different, uh, yeah. And also because LIFO is not allowed international. That's right. Yeah, LIFO is not permitted under IFRS. So it is a perfect example of, of, you know, perhaps an essay question that I would think, you know, have you think about both sides of that. You know, there's a tax issue. Other countries don't give the tax benefits that we get under LIFO. And at the same time, you're not getting, um, you're not permitted to use LIFO internationally. So you're going to find, and that's why when we're doing this homework, that's why until LIFO was eliminated, and in fact, I always kept saying this, there was a um, uh, possibility that US GAAP 
would converge 100% with IFRS. And probably it's not going to happen for some of these reasons, like the use of LIPO in the United States for tax purposes. Um, and if we did converge, there'd be a lot less work to do for all of us because the LIFO method would be gone. But because of the LIFO method, we have to make disclosures that enable users to convert LIFO to FIFO. And that's why the homework emphasis on the reserve and the change in the LIFO reserve, that enables users to convert the LIFO company back to FIFO. And you might say, well, isn't LIFO industry specific? It is, but look what happens. You've got companies that got international subs, and those international subs are on another method. So both of our companies could be in the same industry. We could both be in retail, and you have an international sub. I don't. So therefore, maybe only 60% of your inventory is under LIFO. My inventory may be 100% under LIFO. So it makes sense to convert back to the FIFO basis on both sides. So again, to be comparable, and remember, we said comparability is one of those enhancing qualities of information that we have under the conceptual framework. Remember, qualitative characteristics. Now, it says, it tells you that, um, that the inventory method results in inventory being valued at the lower cost of market. They go to uh, that information with us. And um, any permanent markdowns are recorded as losses and a reduction of inventory. Um, they also use, for Sam's Club, they use the weighted average cost approach for LIFO. Now, what's that? That is a LIFO method that we'll see in intermediate accounting where rather than taking individual prices, they take the average for the year, but they still do it on a LIFO basis. So all of your inventory for this year would be at the 2016 average. All of the inventory last year would be at the 2015 average. And you would just group all your inventory together um, as well. And then finally, um, they tell you the company's inventory values at LIFO and FIFO approximated each other. So that means what's the LIFO reserve equal to? Zero. There's, there's, very no, or there's a nominal difference between LIFO and FIFO. So this type of disclosure is critical. And the reason for the disclosure um, is that you know, inventory is a significant part of a lot of companies' businesses. Uh, it has an impact on both the income statement and the balance sheet. We have to be aware of the risks, and we talked about the operating cycle, the turnover ratios. If you get stuck on any part of that cash cycle, if you can't sell your inventory, if you can't collect those receivables, you've got a, you know, a snag in your cash flow. And if the cash flow is delayed, it could cause problems in terms of paying off liabilities, causing you to borrow money. So uh, it does tell you, by the way, you would be able to, by using the turnover ratios, you'd be able to think about whether or not there's an obsolescence problem. So if the inventory is obsolete, if it's slow moving, it may in fact trigger, although the, the, the idea of the write-off is that, I mean, you, know, you, you, you may be looking at these pieces as discrete steps, but in reality, if you're managing inventory, you're looking at lots of things at the same time. So you're looking at the turnover ratios, which might lead you to look at the inventory to determine whether there is a lower cost of market problem. And then that write down is going to be taken. So we really do this you know, sort of in, in conjunction. Um, and again, you know, the information about high inventory levels could provide insight into, you know, good or bad future. And again, you might have higher, don't forget, the more inventory you, you carry, uh, and especially, remember I mentioned under LIFO, you might buy more inventory to prevent the inventory from shrinking, and there's financing costs, there's storage costs, and insurance costs as well. well let me ask you a question. Does anyone, can anyone think of a reason where high inventory levels at the end of the year could be something positive. And this is where you have to know the company and know the industry. Normally, what you would think, let's say retail, normally in Walmart, what would you expect? You'd expect the inventory to start out at its lowest level because that's at the end of the holiday season. Everything's sold out. Then they start buying again, and then it peaks, and then they sell out again. 
So, and by the way, you saw those, uh, we talked about that during office hours this morning, those unusual year ends for retail companies. You know, it could be February 1st, it could be January 23rd, and that's all based on the cycle. So what those companies try to do is end their year when their inventory levels are the lowest. So normally you'd expect inventory to be low. What, what could a high inventory level tell you on a, in a positive sense? Even in a manufacturing company, why would you be carrying more inventory at the end of the year than normal? Can anyone think of something? Yeah. Um, it'll show more assets um, on your balance. Yeah, but you don't want to just keep buying inventory because then it could become obsolete. Well, you just don't want to buy it to hold it. Why would you? Why would you stock up on something? Personally, why would you stock up on something? Yeah, you might. You might be um, signaling that you expect a growth in sales earlier in the year, so that you may be buying, anticipating a increase in sales, let's say in March or April, so you start buying inventory now to help you meet that demand. So we can't say unequivocally that a high inventory is, is something that's negative, and you have to look at all the facts. Um, and especially in manufacturing companies, you may in fact buy more inventory for what other reason? Why, why would you buy, if you're a manufacturer, why would you be buying up materials and? Economies of scale, get a lower price. Yeah, yeah, because there could be, uh, you might be anticipating price increases. And as long as the uh, raw materials are not um, going to spoil or they're not subject to uh, uh, obsolescence quickly, you could stock up on those parts now and then use them going forward. All right, so any questions on lower cost of market or the inventory disclosures?